Life Rhythms with Ryan Sky. Observing the world around me, looking inward, trying to make sense of it all. Hey guys, welcome to Life Rhythms Radio Show. I am your host, DJ producer Ryan Sky. I've got my co host Scott Waldman joining me later. Right now, I want to introduce my guest for today's episode. I'm so excited to have her on the show. We've got Kaiza. Hey, Kaiza. Hey. <laughs> Thanks for having me. So excited to have you on. For those of you joining in, if this is your first episode of Life Rhythms, it is a radio show that revolves around my, my personal growth journey. As a songwriter and music producer, I spend a lot of my time observing the world around me and looking inward. I've been doing it in song form, and now I'm doing it with my radio show. So each episode of Life Rhythms, is, it features a different personal growth topic. The topic of today's episode is going to be toxic masculinity. It's something I've wanted to talk about for a while. It's a, it's a broad topic. We could have many episodes on the way it affects our society. Specifically in this episode, I'd love to talk about the way toxic masculinity shows up in relationships. Kaiza has a, a song out. It's a song that you listened to when we first entered into this segment. It's called When Boys Cry. And it's a song on her upcoming album, Crave, which comes out on August 14th. And the song, some of the lyrics I'll talk, you know, when you, when you read and when you listen to the song, it says, what's the point of hiding? I can see it in your eyes. Silence is a good decoy, but it isn't a disguise. So what's the point of faking when inside you're breaking? I love this song. I hear a plea from Kaiza, the vocalist. I hear a plea to the person, in, the other person in the relationship to, to be, to kind of find the courage to open up in the relationship that you kind of encouraging this, this man to, to, to open up and to share his feelings. And, and it speaks to something that a lot of us guys experience in life. It's this, it's this challenge of, being able to be open and vulnerable in a relationship. And and a lot of us never really learned how to do it. We, based on our, you know, like women, a a lot of times women learn how to be open. They learn how to forge these vulnerable um, relationships, these kind of platonic intimate relationships with other women. And from a young age, they, they, they're, they're able to, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm speaking in broad terms, but uh, they're able to create kind of a network of, of women, in their lives that they can rely on and go to for help. And they talk through things. And it's not something that I would say is as common with men. It's something more difficult for us. And so, um, you know, as this toxic masculinity kind of plays a role in it, because we were taught not to share our feelings and to be stoic and, and um, you know, those sorts of things. What well, basically through the research of the episode, I found that 5% of men, only 5% seek mental health services, despite feeling lonelier than ever. And what's more is that men conceal pain and illness at a much higher rate than women do. And they're three times more likely than women to die from suicide. Black men face an added set of barriers, including systemic discrimination, racial stereotypes, cultural stigma against mental illness. So, you know, this is something that this is very relevant. There's a lot going on with this right now. And, and we're going to talk about this today. I have Kaiza on the show. We're going to go over her song and we're going to, you know, lighthearted, share our experiences and, and really dive into When Boys Cry. We'll be doing that right after this short break. See you in a moment. Hey guys, welcome back to Life Rhythms Radio Show. I'm your host, Ryan Sky. The song you were just listening to is a song called When Boys Cry by Kaiza. Kaiza is our special guest for today on the show. Very excited to have her. Hey, girl. <laughs> hey. Hey, hey, hey. The, How are you doing? I'm doing great. You know, I'm so excited to dive into this topic of toxic masculinity. When I looked at the lyrics of your song, and I, I see lyrics, you say, when boys cry, you got to learn what to see in their dry eyes. And you may have to listen through their gritted teeth. I could, I, as a guy could relate to that. And I was excited when I, when I was listening to this song because I thought, Oh, well, first of all, I have a list of topics that I want to cover on my show. Mas- toxic masculinity was one of them. And when I listened to your song, I thought, yes, this is the perfect opportunity to dive into this. So yeah. that's, I'm excited about that. When, yeah, when did I'm you write this too. song? You wrote this uh, last year. Recently. I think I wrote okay. it. Yeah. Last year. Um, okay. I begun writing it like it, it started as a totally different song about okay. the same concept. And then I, and that was years ago and I just felt like I didn't nail it. And um, last year I was with my friend, Chris Malinchuk and I was just like, Hey, like 
this is coming up so much, this topic. And it's something that I think it'd be cool to write a song about. And I had these like different lyrics and then I recrafted everything and this song came about. It's such a poignant song. And so you and Chris collaborated on this track, right? Yeah, I wrote all the melody and lyrics and he did the, the production. I kind of led it in the sense that I love, I wanted it to have a, like be led by the drums and have a very tribal feel, but, um, okay. but he, he made it sound the way it did. <laughs> What, what was the inspiration behind the song? Does this come from a personal experience? I'm curious. Yeah, yeah. I grew up with men. Um, most of my family members are men, like in, both in my immediate family and in my extended family. So um, I am very used to being around the male species. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, so the, 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 this comes from some of your observations in your life? Yeah, and just also dealing with the emotions of men. I mean, I have a lot of friends who are men. I've had... You know, I grew up with my brothers and they've been through a lot and they've talked to me about what they're going through and I've expressed my feelings to them and we do express in very different ways. Okay. We process our emotions differently. So, yeah. I've noticed, and then just I've noticed that I've too. In the past. Okay. Dating specifically, I would love to dive into. I want to bring on my co-host, Scott Waldman. He's also my manager. Hey, Scott. Hello. Okay. So for every episode, I usually write a quote. Um, to kind of set it up. And so this is the quote that I wrote for this episode. And the quote says, shame, Brene Brown found in her years of research is the single biggest cause of toxic masculinity. Whereas women experience shame when they fail to meet unrealistic or conflicting expectations, men become consumed with shame for showing signs of weakness. Toxic masculinity mm. keeps men isolated and incapable of leaning on each other. Unlike women who are encouraged to foster deep platonic relationships from a young age, American men grow up believing that they should not only behave like stoic robots in front of other men, but that women are the only people that are, are allowed, that they're allowed to turn to for emotional support, if anyone at all. So across the spectrum, women seem to be, and this is what I found in researching for this episode, that women seem to be pointing out the same thing, that while they are reading countless self-help books, listening to podcasts, seeking out career advisors, turning to their female friends for advice and support, that the men in their lives simply are relying on the women and not doing those things for themselves. That's, or that's, relying on no one. Or nobody, yeah. That's what I'd love to talk about today is just kind of like the way that men and women cope with relationships and and this um, toxic masculinity kind of keeps it. I almost notice that a lot of adult men are kind of emotionally stunted because of these these kind of like concepts that they grow up with and, and they never really learn how to be emotionally open. H have you noticed that in your relationships? Oh, absolutely. Um, I've, I've noticed that in my relationships. I've noticed that with my own brothers. Okay. I've noticed that with my friends. I think society is actually built upon this really old fashion foundation that hasn't really gone away and it's passed down behavioral patterns are passed down. Um, you even see it in movies. I mean, everywhere the man has to be this strong her heroic figure. You know, yes. it's not enough to just be a normal guy. <laughs> you know, that's not enough. Whereas like women can just kind of like, you know, w women also have, have had because of the structure of society um, they've had to deal, like they've been the maternal figure and they've, been raising the families. So just by default, they've learned how to handle a lot of different people and a lot of different emotions. And, you know, you, 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 that gets passed down as well from your mother to their mother to daughter. And so I think even within families, um, mothers teach their daughters different things than they teach their sons. Fathers teach their sons different things than they teach their daughters. And, and then, so I think now that we have so much social media and we're mm -hmm. able to talk with so many people and connect globally, um, all these conversations are coming up and people are starting to become aware. Um, I liked what you said when women, or that quote, going back to that quote, women experience shame when they don't meet expectations. Okay. Whereas men, yeah, men experience shame when they, when they um, show weakness. It's, um, and, well, but, in some but ways they're similar, in some ways they're different. Well, I, I can tell you okay. from the straight male perspective of someone who was born in 1981 that um, I experienced a lot of toxic masculinity from male friends and enemies because I just, I was not into athletics. I was really into music and that would be 
I mean, the word back then, which obviously right now, which thankfully has been erased from a lot of people is fag. You'd be called a fag for stuff like that. And you would basically, it would be hurled at you as an insult that if you didn't like that stuff, you were gay. Right. And insult, And obviously yeah. Ryan has a completely different perspective on that. Yeah. It's interesting when yeah, I came also- out, you have something to add to that, Kaiser? I was going to say, um, also like men who were maybe artistic or had like, because a lot of women are, it's like, they're, they're, they're really encouraged to do very artistic things. But then if a man wants to do the same things or wants to take ballet class, for example, he's called, he's called the same name, you know? Um, sorry, go ahead. No, no, yeah, no. I, mean, I did theater. So, you know, you could definitely fill in the blanks there. I did yeah. theater too. <laughs> no, so did I. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Oh, did you? We all did theater. Oh, yeah. <laughs> all right. Anyway. Yeah, I was gonna say. <laughs> let's let's just let's just change this to a show tune episode. All right. Um, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be Seymour. Uh, Kaiser's gonna be Audrey, and oh, Ryan, yes. Ryan, you could be the plant. Oh, I know the whole song. I know yes. Seymour. I don't. I don't know the plant. Oh, no. <laughs> so real yes. Can you do the accent, Kaiser? Can you <laughs> show me your face? What is it? It's clean show as the morning. Yes, I played Audrey a little bit more. Seymour. Yes. Uh, I just want a man like Seymour. <laughs> yeah. Seymour's your friend. <laughs> I just, yeah, I just wrote a musical, actually. Did you? Yeah. <laughs> is it, are, are you going to be workshopping? It's it? in progress. Wow. Yeah, very soon. Yeah, the, it's the, the pandemic, pandemic definitely. It's the Canadian perspective on America. It's called Big Shop of Horrors. <laughs> <laughs> big, big box, big box of horrors. <laughs> that's and good. Exactly, that's actually toxic masculinity. That's be a musical. <laughs> strip mall, strip mall of horrors. How Canadians picture of you Americans? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Don't get on my lawn. I got a shotgun. <laughs> is this is this the like, first musical you wrote? <laughs> What's <laughs> yep. Awesome. So is this the first musical about, you wrote? Yeah, it's weird. I tend to like, I'm weird. I tend to write things in twos. So I came up with two musical concepts and then I okay. picked the one that I thought like made the most sense to write first. And then I wow. partnered with a book writer and wrote the songs with a friend of mine. We're still, we're actually writing a few more songs now that we have the script. Once you have the first draft, you start kind of pulling it apart and adding it in. So we're developing some characters further and giving them songs. So wow. I was supposed it- to go literally the week that the pandemic or that the lockdowns all happened. I was supposed to go to New York and finish writing and then the borders all shut down. Was writing a musical something you've always wanted to do or did it just come up? Yeah, it, it was something I always wanted to do. It's something that I never really had the opportunity to do or the time because it's a lot of work. Um, but I was in a big car crash three years ago and, essentially was I've been in isolation for three years. Let's just put it that way. Um, so I've in the midst of all that, I was like, you know what, why don't I just come up with some musical concepts? And when I'm in a place to be able to put them together, I will. And I really fleshed out the idea so much that we ended up when I got with the book writer, we finished the whole script in a week. Wow. Yeah. I I haven't I haven't heard any of your music from the show, but just from what I've heard of your music that you've released in your career, I've always found you to be such a talented storyteller. So much detail. Yeah. So much detail in, in your songs. I, I can totally see you nailing a musical. I'd be very excited it, to hear it's it. It's fun. It's got, it's like got a lot of the classic feels of musical and it's funny. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. It's funny. And you're going to be workshopping it. Yeah, I can let you know more about it. If you if if you want to meet up in LA when I'm there, I can share some of the music with you. Yeah, I would love that. I'll yeah, love to hear um, but, it. but but, but Kaiser, I just want: Are you doing okay from the accent? Because that was just obviously said really oh, quick. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, I I thought my career was done for. I thought my life was done for for a good year and a half, and then I just was like, you know what? Whatever it means, coming back, whether I'm a ukulele player or a folk singer, or I, whether I can dance again or not, I'm gonna find a way to come back. And so last year I toured as a ukulele player. <laughs> so, and by this year I'm dancing again. So it's, I got a traumatic brain injury and it was a pretty, uh, pretty serious one. And I lost balance on the left side of my body. I 
my brain lost the ability to digest most foods because of where it was hit and my immune system was really compromised. So I was very sick a lot of the time and stuck in, stuck in bed for almost a year. Oh God. Um, Yeah, it was really bad. Um, So, I I mean, we could talk about that for a whole podcast, but um, yeah, but yeah, yeah. I I just, I I just felt bad because you said it and I didn't want to just live like, okay, cool. Let's talk about about, um, some fun now. Like, no, yeah. so I didn't want to. I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, Scott, I, I had known about the accident as just as part of Kaiza's story. So when she said it, I just, in my mind, I thought, oh yeah, I, I you know, I know about that. And, and, uh, but I'm glad you brought it up because I imagine there are listeners that weren't aware of what yeah, your experience um, was. Yeah. yeah. You said it so nonchalantly. So I was just well, like, yeah, I mean, it's, I guess for me, it sort of became my everyday, like right. I'm going to LA right very soon. I've, given uh, an essential pass to cross the border to do further my rehab, you know, for recovery. There's still things I'm working on. Like I had to sort of essentially relearn how to read again. Um, so my brain, I have to relearn how to track a page because my brain does, it has struggles with little things like that. So I'm slow at reading and it was tough for me. I mean, tough to identify as what felt like what I felt like was a broken person. I was always, <laughs> I was like superwoman. I, nothing, I'd never really, <laughs> had struggled. I broke a rib and did a whole music video, you know, <laughs> like, uh, wow. I just pushed through anything, but this just knocked me off in a way that I could have never imagined. And so it sort of reset my whole life. Um, wow. and, and I've really managed to grow a lot as a result. Um, yeah. Uh, tying it into the, the topic of this episode, um, as you were dealing with your, your injury, did you rely on, were you able to turn to women in your life or who, who, who was, hel- who was helpful in you, in your life to deal with and, and move through what you're experiencing? I'm curious. I, I, I can't say I have amazing men and women in my life. Um, my friend, Chris Malinchuk, who I make a lot of music with, he was there for me. My manager, Luba, she wasn't my manager at the time. She was always my choreographer and my creative collaborator. She was there for me. Um, um, a lot of people didn't understand the brain injury because they couldn't see it. And that was my biggest struggle. Oh, that's my, interesting. my record label did not understand at all. <laughs> my management, my previous management did not understand at all. And um, they kind of just wrote me off as like, I don't know, like never coming back or they just pulled their support. Oh. And at the flip side, I was able to get out of my label really easily <laughs> after the accident. And I, and I wanted to in the first place. So <laughs> Um, that made it a lot easier. And, um, but yeah, I guess there weren't a lot of people who understood how severe it was. Um, but I mean, That's I don't, in- yeah, it's not like, I don't think, I mean, I have to say it to, with toxic masculinity, it's, that doesn't apply to all men, you know? I, I agree. It doesn't apply to all men. The idea of what you're talking about of having, um, whether it's a, a, a brain injury or a mental illness, it's, it's all of these sorts of things that are unseen from the outside. And, and that is an issue that people deal with that they experience is that they're suffering from depression or they're suffering from anxiety or, or whatever it is that they're experiencing. And, and, and people around them sometimes maybe have a hard time taking it seriously or really understanding the extent of the suffering because it's all going on behind the scenes. It's all yeah. kind of invisible. And I'm guilty of being one of those people before I was in a car crash. Yeah. I never had a headache my whole life. Like nothing, like nothing serious. Um, nothing that gave me any sort of perspective on what a migraine felt like. And what I had was like 10 times worse than a severe migraine. So I went through this whole phase of feeling bad that I, <laughs> that I didn't, Maybe it wasn't more sympathetic to my friends who told me they had migraines and I really had to deconstruct my whole life and realize that these, these invisible injuries are very, very serious and very isolating and actually the cause of many mental illnesses because of that isolated feeling, um, the feeling of not being understood or kind of invisible and trapped inside your own body for, well, silence is a good decoy. Yes. <laughs> good. <laughs> Good bring full of the lyrics. <laughs> yeah, lyrics. Yeah, but for the listeners out there, it's one of the lyrics. <laughs> Say that again. I said, but it isn't a disguise. That's what well, what's the point of faking when inside you're breaking? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> Have then- you have you heard have you seen the documentary called My Beautiful Broken Brain? Yes. 
About the girl who has a stroke. Yes. God, have you seen that? No, I'm literally typing it in Google right now. Yeah, so that's a that's a very severe case of a brain injury through a stroke. Um, for, I, for the list, of, yeah. I experienced Did, were you able to relate to it? All those weird colors and stuff that she saw, and the weird orbs, and I saw that. Oh wow! Did you? I would literally be sitting in the room, and then there'd be this giant floating ball of purple, <laughs> like just floating in the room. Oh, it was wow. often. It was often purple, but it'd be like this just orb of purple. It was really psychedelic. Yeah, it feels and like I, a trip. Some people like some people think it was like me tapping into another dimension. Some people just think it was pressure on my occipital lobe. Like nobody can really explain it. But it I have to say, like, for all the pain that I experienced, the orbs were, were pretty cool. <laughs> like <laughs> I was just like, that's pretty cool. It's like a floating ball of purple just there. <laughs> like and, and so it's not there now. It it's it's healed or it's. Uh, I get like little hints of it, but it's not not like that. No. <laughs> it was, okay. It was a trip. I, I've never actually taken any drugs. I mean, it, unless you call caffeine and alcohol a drug, you know. Yeah. But so I've never tr- halluc- had hallucinogenics or anything. But I was kind of like, okay, I'm pretty sure this is sort of what it must be like. <laughs> so. It's interesting. For yeah. the listeners that are, um, re- I referenced the My Beautiful Broken Brain, just like a quick, just to let people know about it. It's a documentary. It's on Netflix and it, it's about, um, she, her, she, it was about, um, a lady who she, re- she ha- suffers from a stroke and the stroke affects half of her brain. And in the, in the documentary, she, she loses her ability to read and write and speak coherently. And she sees kind of on, on one side of her visual spectrum, she's seeing these colors and all of these distortions. And she reaches out to David Lynch, uh, you know, famous director. And, and she, she reaches out to David Lynch and she says to him, you know, I think you would be really interested into, into getting to know me and my story because my, what I'm actually seeing from my brain injury, I feel like I'm in a David Lynch movie, but it's, it's real. Right, so so David now. Lynch executive produces this movie called my beautiful broken brain. And in the movie, the whole documentary is about her rehabbing her brain, but also it, she is not able to remember. She, she has difficulty with memory. So the documentary also serves as a way for her to watch her own journey on screen and actually see what's happened yeah. to her and be able to comprehend where she's at. And what I love about the documentary is like before her accident, she was a very talented filmmaker, storyteller. And then after the accident, she, she couldn't make films anymore. And, and she had difficulty with storytelling and, and memory and stuff. And kind of the, the concept behind the documentaries that asks, like, what are we? Are we, are we our brain or are we like, what happens if your brain gets broken? Does that mean we're broken? Are we our, the physical brain? Or are we what's, you know, the result of something beyond the brain? Um, I had some experiences, um, not to that extreme, but with a lot of these things, um, I had minor versions of them. Um, I lost my ability to connect with my memories myself. So if I wanted to remember a specific event, I couldn't, but if somebody told it to me, I would basically reconnect that bridge. Oh, wow. And I still have trouble. Like if you ask me about the whole hideaway run, I can't put anything in order. I can't remember what year it was, what what month it was. I have to go to my calendar to be like, Oh, this happened this year. So I can't remember. (laughs) Like it's, so I literally have my friends like tell me stories to rewire my brain. And, um, I, it was, uh, I I didn't realize that, you know, they say, don't hold on to anything. Don't be possessive of anything. Right. Um, yeah, that includes your memories. We hold on, we covet our memories. We hoard them actually. And I didn't realize that till I was disconnected from a lot of my own memories and to a point where I panicked and I was just like, I didn't know who I was anymore without my memories. And then I had to kind of sit there and and, and ask myself like, okay, if I never connect with my memories again, all I have is the present. <laughs> yes. And that's all I'll ever have. So I have to be wow. okay with, I have You're to be like okay. With not remembering, yeah. I, I have to be okay with maybe not remembering my childhood. I lost a lot of memories from my childhood. Um, so, but is that okay? Because I, I lived my childhood. It's still there. It's still created who I am. And just because I can't access direct memories that my brain held on for whatever reason, um, that doesn't, 
I had to just sort of let them go and wow. say goodbye. And I'm, I'm okay. I'm okay with not remembering. Wow. It sounds like you were noticing this attachment that we tend to have towards our memories and you, you had to go through a process of kind of not holding, not, de- not defining yourself by these memories, like the yeah, story I mean, of who you are. It's like a hoarding a, a room. It's like, it's like holding on to junk that we should get rid of. Sometimes I actually realize that we hold on to memories that traumatize us. There's some memories we need to let go of that we don't, we shouldn't be accessing, you know, we should just let them go. And are, clean, are you familiar with Eckhart junk. Tolle? A little bit. I, I mean, I, I again, I've, I, I was, I've read a lot in the past and things like that, but I've, I'm, I'm reconnecting a lot of <laughs> even right things I've yeah. yeah. Eckhart Tolle talk. He's a spiritual teacher, and he talks about these sorts of things. Um, what exactly what you're talking about? And he he calls it the little me, and he says that we all have. We all have, it's the story of me that we tell ourselves. And we basically take whatever memories we have that are convenient to the story we want to tell of who we are. And we constantly tell ourselves of, this is who I am. This is where I grew up. This is what happened to me. This is the, and and we use this culmination of these memories to then create this image in our head of who we think we are. And then we, we, we become attached to that. And, and our identity is defined by, by that. And, and he, encourages us to be, as you were saying, to be more present, to be in the moment, to realize that the past and the future don't really exist. We only have the present moment and to let go of the little me, to let go of those memories and realize that that doesn't define who you are. Yeah. Sounds like that's exactly what you've experienced from a firsthand basis. Yeah. And that's something I had to come to terms with because to think that you might not remember your own childhood is a really hard thought (laughs) because it's a special part of your life, you know? Um, but what about the people in your lives that shared these memories with you that maybe you don't remember and they do, is it, is it hard for them as well to deal with that? I think so. Um, a lot of people will say things like, Oh, remember that time we did this or this or this. And <laughs> I'm like, wow, no, I'm sorry. Like, t- but tell me, like, you know, tell me yeah, what happened. Like, <laughs> tell me what happened. And sometimes as they tell me the story, I start to remember and it's like my brain and I can feel my brain like glitching, like almost like little fireworks going off. And it's like, ah, putting these back together. <laughs> so it's like, it's like a, like a plow is just plowing out all the trees in the way of the road. <laughs> wow. So interesting. Yeah. Brains are pretty fascinating and especially having a broken brain. You actually learn about a lot about how your brain works because I was separated from my feeling of oneness because <laughs> there's all these blockages. So my brain wasn't communicating like quick enough to make me feel like one, I was actually feeling all the different minds in my body separately. So I could feel my heart network separate of my gut network, separate of my head. And I started calling my head a calculator, <laughs> you know, and I started calling my chest, like my, uh, like my gut is my fear center and my my heart network is where i where i want is where i go towards what i want and um when the heart network collapses it triggers the fear network when the fear gives a feedback the calculator in your brain starts looking for fear in the outside world um if it if it's not around you it finds something if if you feel fear in your gut your brain is going to look for fear in the world and if and, and it's going to find it because your because your gut it can't be wrong you know to your brain so that's why I think people actually dump onto their spouses and people they love because <laughs> their brain's looking for fear and if it doesn't find it it goes to the path of least resistance and then again we're bringing it back to this to actually this conversation of why why do people dump on the people they trust the most yes I. Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful way to bring it back. I love that. And, <laughs> and the timing, it couldn't be more perfect because we're, we're um, coming to the end of, of segment one. We're going to take a quick break. And when we get back, I would love to dive into this conversation of dumping on your loved ones and, and where it comes from and kind of what our experiences has, has been when we get right back. Yay. Okay. See you in a second. We'll be right back after this short Bye. break. And we are back with Life Rhythms Radio Show. I'm your host, Ryan Skye. I have my co-host and manager, Scott Waldman, with me, and a very special guest, Kaiza. Hi, Hi. Kaiza. Hey, Scott. Hi. 
We are featuring Kaiser's track called When Boys Cry, which is com- which is going to be on her upcoming album, Crave, which comes out on August 14th. Yes. And When Boys Cry, she talks about, if you look at some of the lyrics, she says, teardrops turning into rust, still your eyes are saying so much, truth is hiding. She talks about, um, help me with your feelings, keep your secret between us, show me where the hurt is underneath the surface. She says things like, I- I'm the one you're supposed to trust. It's about relationships and, and, and I wanted to talk about toxic masculinity, specifically about how that affects relationships. I'm going to set the scene. I was doing some research and I, I was reading an, an article in Harper's Bazaar by, uh, her name's Melanie Hamlet. And the, the article says men have no friends and women bear the burden. And I think I'm going to, I'm going to kind of give a quick rundown of what she's talking about. And I think it, it'll set up what we, what we, what we're going to discuss. So in this article, Melanie, she talk, tells the story of Kelly. And Kelly is a 24-year-old English teacher. She's studying for her PhD. And Kelly says of her that, that she's had to talk her boyfriend through his aspirations, validate his opinions, support his career. She's had to be his emotional guru because he was too afraid to admit he had any emotions at all. Kelly's boyfriend refused to talk to other men or a therapist about his feelings. So he'd often get into these funks, quote unquote, picking pointless fights when something was bothering him. And eventually Kelly became his default therapist, soothing his anxieties as he fretted over work or family problems. And after three years together, when exhaustion and anxiety landed Kelly in the hospital and her, her boyfriend claimed that he was too busy to visit her, that's when they broke up. Wow. It's, it's, a, it's, it's an interesting, it's, it's an extreme story, but it does talk about how kind of guys tend to put this burden on, on the, their partner and the relationship when they don't have men in their lives that they can turn to because they don't really know how to have those sort of like platonic intimate relationships with other guys because they never really learned how to do that growing up. There's, so what, I, what, what do you think about that? <laughs> I, I, that, that so that's a story. I, I kind of just want to set that as a talking point and just, and just kind of go from there. I have a lot of thoughts. I mean, first of all, I relate to that. Um, all my relationships, I've experienced that to some degree or another. My first, one of my first ones, I had a boyfriend who did claim that he had no emotions at all. And yet that was obviously not the case because he reacted to everything emotionally. So, okay. you know, I knew that not to be true, but. Um, but again, like, um, it, I was in a case, I was in the position of actually fighting his battles for him. Um, he didn't want to confront people. I had to confront them for him. Um, I'd often like, if he was upset about something, he'd, he'd tell me about it and he'd be really angry and angry to the point where it caused me to have a reaction. But I'm very much of the mindset of like, if you're upset, do something about it. But it sort of fell on me to do, to do something for him. And so I'd always be like, the bad guy, like picking up the phone, be like trying to solve the problem. And, um, it was a lot, it was really, really intense. And, and, um, it, it actually was the reason that things ended in that case. And then I had another relationship was, which I related to basically it. Um, I'm trying to remember the exact thing you said, but, um, just going through these funks, Yes. Because, because they would, he wouldn't go to therapy. He had a very tough life growing up. He had a lot of trauma, came from a dangerous place and came out of poverty and, you know, kind of built himself up, but he hadn't dealt with his past and it, it haunted him every day. And he didn't want to talk to me. He just sort of like dumped on me. He'd cry, uh, he'd cry and complain about his life. He, but he wouldn't allow me to help him solve his problems. Although I ended up talking for hours weekly <laughs> oh. but again it's like it was like a dumping zone it was like he just needed somebody to empty out his the energy and his system. yeah that he didn't know how to process because he wasn't processing it anywhere else in the world and so it's intense and again that ultimately is what caused me to get overwhelmed and be like i'm check out be like i can't do this like i i have to also look after myself i can't look after myself and, and, and you in this way. So, so yeah. In, in the, in the very beginning of relationships, when I'm curious if there's, if there's kind of like a, a seductive element to dating a guy in the beginning who seems to be 
you know, reserved and you kind of feel like you can help him and you can save him and you can open him up. And is there a gratification at first that you feel when the, when the guy does start opening up, like you're helping him and then it kind of takes its toll on the relationship? I think there's a charm in that mystery and that collective okay. collected kind of behavior. So, you know, women have a more prayful side to them. They're all wiggly and, hey, you know, their voices are all, you know, we, we, we express ourselves a lot more, I think physically and we, we we let a lot of our personality out of our system whereas men are kind of holding it in and so <laughs> you know if you just look at the prey predator dynamics of nature that run through everything um it's actually very preyful to to not do anything it makes you want to chase them it makes you want to find them it makes you want to go on a treasure hunt and dig them up it's actually it's fun you're like i want to find out who this person is and it's charming at, at first <laughs> But you, you think that once you, once you get below the surface that you're going to find this hidden treasure that you eventually realize isn't necessarily there. <laughs> so I can relate to that. Yeah. yeah. I can relate uh, to that. The first, the first episode of Life Rhythms that we did was on, um, um, it was on, um, uh, relationships, uh, attachment theory, attachment theory. Mm. And it was called emotionally, it was about emotionally unavailable men. Yeah. And, and we, t- and we talked about this, about men that have a dismissive avoidant attachment style in the beginning, it unintentionally is a very, um, it, it can create attraction because of the mystery. Like you were saying, the mystery and the charm and they're holding back and they're not really trying and they're reserved and they seem to be strong because they're stoic. And so you get pulled in and you're, you're, you start chasing them. And like you said, you kind of, you, you cut, you're expecting this treasure underneath but the the closer you get when they actually start opening up you really you start to see all of the kind of problems that actually are creating this dysfunctional personality in them and then yeah. it takes its toll and it's much like a, a hose that has too much water flowing through it but that's plugged <laughs> Ooh, so and then it, and then it, the and surface, you just you you walk right into the pressure zone and there's these moments of explosion right yeah oh yeah and it's either <laughs> at some Brian, point it has, it has to talk about that <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's, it's coming up. It, it implodes and it implodes and it implodes. And then yeah. I mean, the surface breaks and it all comes out at once very powerfully. <laughs> so, and that that's that, I mean, as you said that as I sounded like you, like a balloon popped or a clap. It was like, yeah. Was like, <laughs> oh, do we have sound effects now on this show? <laughs> Emily? <laughs> Add yeah. yeah. Well, we're going to make the sound effects really, really crappy though. Intentionally though. Like kind of like a 50s. Low high. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it all comes out. I, I think about this a lot. Like, um, you know, if you're, if you're out in the ocean and you get this like nice little wave, it's, it's like, it's like a nice, you, you can, you can be paddle boarding and standing up and you can get over that wave and not be knocked over. But if a tidal wave comes like, you're done for. <laughs> so right. well, we, I mean, if you think about that, just with the waves that we create in our relationships and with our, within our life, um, if, if it all comes out as a tidal wave, you might not be able to come back from it. And I think that's what happens a lot is they implode so much that when the pressure finally explodes onto somebody else, it's like being hit by a tidal wave and it's traumatic and they can't, they, it kills, it literally kills the relationship. Um, it does. So, so that's why it's better that, if you have a constant flow of communication, you never, the pressure never builds up. It never explodes. So it, that's, that's really what when boys cry is about. It's about encouraging men. It's about supporting men to let their feelings out consistently so that they don't have to go through the pain of holding it in. First of all, I can't, I can't, can only imagine how hard that is having to live with that kind of pressure. Well, I, you, you actually brought up something that is going to sound kind of random, but it isn't my roommate out here. When I first moved to LA, he told me that asking questions was a sign of weakness. Like if we were ever like lost driving and this is before, you know, smartphones, oh, GPS. That's my biggest frustration. Yeah. Well, me too. And I'm just like, <laughs> Many don't but, ask but, directions. but dude, we're literally lost. Like, yes. Like, like if we go to this gas station, which is what you ba- remember back in the day, when you get lost, you go to a gas station, you ask them to tell you where to go. Um, yes. I mean, and, and I was just like, what, so what's weaker being lost and not talking about it or being lost and being productive about it? Well, um, yeah, cause they don't want to be vulnerable, but they actually put everyone around them at risk. And so it's, yep. it's not, it's not a strength to put everyone around you at risk. Nope. 
Yeah, there's, <laughs> there's it. Masculinity can be confusing for guys because we do receive many different signals from different parts of society of what it means to be a man, and and some of it can be confusing, and some of it's some of it comes from older generations and and is is outdated, and then some you know you have like the modern man. I know myself, it could be very confusing because I'm gay. And so there's like, you know, I grew up, I didn't come out till I was 21. And so I grew up hiding a lot of things and trying to prove to people that I was a man and, and then just like dealing with what does it mean to be a man? And uh, even uh, a couple of years ago, this is, you were talking about asking directions. I was in Utah with a friend and we were, we were hiking in, um, in the canyons, in Bryce Canyon. And we went for this sunset hike. And we were very excited about it, but we weren't prepared. We didn't have water. We didn't have a flashlight. We had no cell service. And we go on this hike in, it's one of the most rural places in the country. And the sun sets very quickly. There was no moon that night. It was a new moon, which we, we did that on purpose because we wanted to see the stars, but we got lost, really lost on, on one of these, um, they're called hoodoos. So we're on top of this hoodoo in the middle of nowhere and everything goes down and we were lost and we were walking around for hours trying to get off of this trail. And my friend kept asking me, it was a female. Actually, this is really interesting. So it was with a female and she right away was like, we should call for help. Let's, there's a community in the distance. You could see the lights on and she's like, let's scream help. And the idea of that was just like so mortifying to me in the moment. I didn't want just the idea of me screaming and admitting that I needed help to somebody. I just wasn't ready. I said, no, 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 no. Like I, I got this. I got this. Like follow me. I'm going to. I'll get us out of there. I wanted to be a man. I wanted to lead wanted us to out be of a there. man. That, that, right. Isn't that phrase like be a man? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And I wanted to be, I got caught up in this idea of like being a man and not admitting that I needed help. So we, we walked around for hours, hours. And it was like, it was 11 PM. It was getting really cold and I, I was, we were completely lost and we, we tried every which way to get out. We went the opposite way of the trail. We went off the trails and we kept coming to the same place. And it got to the point where I realized we had another eight hours of, of darkness that we would be stuck there with no water. And, and it was, I was, it was really dangerous. So it did get to a point where finally I said, okay, okay, let's do it. So let's call for help. So we had our flashlights and we just started screaming, help, help us, you know, like on top of our lungs. And it was, at first it felt very embarrassing. And then I got over it and it, it, it worked. People heard us and you could hear them in the distance like, hey, do you hear that? I, I think there's people over there. And, and then and then they shine their flashlight and they said, you know, what's wrong? And we we're like, we're lost. We can't get down. And they're like, okay, we're going to send somebody. And they ended up sending um, a, tr uh, a tr park ranger came and sent people up in, in about an hour. It was like a search and rescue. And they came and they got us and they brought us down. And And even the guys that came up to get us, they got lost on the way down as well. And they knew the trails. It was just when it's dark, everything looks yeah, different. Can't see anything. And when I saw the way that I, when I saw the actual way that we got down, I realized there's no way we ever would have figured that out. Thank God we, we did call for help because we would have been up there for hours. And I yeah. saw black widow spiders and I saw scorpions. And I mean, you know, who knows what, wow. what happened. Did, did, did that change the way that you approach things moving forward? Do you, do you think? It really got me to think of, it, it made me realize that I still have, I, I still have kind of misconceptions or I still need to, to really think through what it means to be a man and, and, um, that, that I still had some of these, these ideas in my mind that I, that weren't helpful, that weren't helpful, the kind of getting think, in the way. I think being a man means living your life, uh, not because of a more. You know, not a more like love, like amore, but like a societal more. I think that that would be the real way to be a man and, or just to be a human. I don't know. That's my two cents. So when you say that, can you expand on that a little bit? Yeah. Just like living your truth. Like don't like do something because it's a manly thing to do or not do something because it's, you know, feminine. Just do what you got to do and do what you want to do and don't try so hard to Oh, I can't like that. I can't wear pink because that's a woman's color. Right. You know? Yeah. Just do what resonates with you and do what's what's better for the for the group, for the, the greater good. Um like in that case it would have been in the best interest of everyone to have called for help earlier. Yeah. Right. I, when I, I think about it 
<laughs> I can What's- still be lost from from my my old roommate being like, "No, you can't ask for directions." I'm just like, "Why?" Anyway. <laughs> When I think about the, you know, the signals that I received growing up, it's that a man leads, a man, you know, somebody that you can rely on and who that you can follow and kind of like let your guard down and he takes care of things. And if you're in a situation, he fixes the situation and all of these kinds of pressures. And and when I think about what we talked about earlier, it's all performance based. It's like performing as a man. It's it's getting us out of the situation. It's It's resolving being lost and finding the path home. It's leading. It's not getting worried. I mean, the, 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 the female that I was with my friend, she was getting very upset and I found myself really trying to not show emotion and just be like, Oh, it's fine. We're going to, you know, just follow me. We'll, we'll get out of here. And eventually I had to come to terms with myself with the idea that I, I couldn't get us out of that situation on my own and that it was best to, to call for help. Well, and I'm glad we took- did eventually call for help. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there yeah. would be no life rhythms had you not done that. So I'm glad you're yeah. here. I know. I, I've, I've I never, think, never yeah. known what would have happened. I do think that a lot of this quote, toxic masculinity is founded in that sort of like that preconceived idea that men have to lead. Um, and then what does that mean? What does lead, leading even mean? Cause um, there's just, just so many angles you can come from, from that. Um, men are all, are the hunters, you know, it's just, throughout society they've been the ones who go out they 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 had the careers they made the money they brought home the food you know so they're like the hunters of the family the women were essentially the gatherers you know they're raising the kids keeping everybody safe um but they were leading the house in that sense so um but i think there's this pressure that they're always like like when you're out there on the path you're like you're hunting for the path you're hunting for you know how to get out but you're not thinking Okay, women are thinking very broad. <laughs> okay. You know, the women when we're really good at problem solving cuz it's I mean especially with having to navigate so many things at once, you know, it's just it's how can I do this as quick as I can <laughs> in the most efficient way possible. So we're and like so- okay, we're lost. How do we get out as fast as humanly possible? I don't care what that means <laughs> to me. I just let's just do it, you know? Okay, we're lost. Call for help. <laughs> it's the easiest way. <laughs> yeah, so as a woman when you think about calling for help, what goes through your mind? It, you don't experience shame. See, for me, I was feeling shame at the at the thought of having to ask for help, which is it's unnecessary. It's it's not. I didn't need to feel that, but it was just kind of an automatic response based on my conditioning. Yeah, whereas a woman would feel shame if if she didn't get us out of there. Um, uh, she doesn't care how she gets us out of there. She just wants to get us out of there. You know, um, and that's again, it's not it's not um, meeting the expectations. Um, so. It, that that is going back to that initial quote. Um, yeah, I, I, it's, it's, there's this persistent idea that feelings are a kind of a female thing, as far as with toxic masculinity, and it leaves a, uh, it's kind of left a whole generation of men where it's kind of stranded on this emotionally. It's funny though island. because in that situation, when you were lost, you the 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 female was not relying on her feelings; she was relying on logic. She was actually she wasn't being emotional. I mean, she was probably feeling scared. I have a question for both of you because obviously it's 2020. I really think though that things have gotten better in terms of men being uh, like socially accepted uh, people who can speak with emotions. Do you guys think that? I think, I think it's definitely moving in the right direction. I don't think it's fully gotten there completely but yeah definitely and the reason is because conversations have been coming up it's been spoken about in the public people are actually starting to change the dialogue that actually not showing weakness is a weakness (laughs) so um i think it's giving permission i don't think men had permission to be vulnerable before and we're saying be vulnerable that's strong um it's it's rewarded there's no shame if we're taking shame away from you know, we're taking shame out of the, the scenario, then the men are, I think, able to open up a lot more. I I agree with that. I, I can see the di- the conversation has changed and there's a, there's more acceptance to the idea of men being open and, and connecting with their feelings. And I, I see men being more open to that as well. And it, it seems like we're in a place right now where 
men are more open to the idea, but maybe not sure. Okay. Okay. You know, I'm, I'm open to these ideas of, 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 of learning to express my feelings, but how do I do that? I mean, women were taught from a young age. I wasn't, so I'm still kind of not sure how to do it. When I was researching for that, for this episode, one of the things that came across was men's support groups. Men's support groups seem to be um, a, a very helpful solution because um, like just, I was reading one of the support groups example of what they do is they'll have like a five minute meditation and then they'll follow it by discussions on everything from how to deal with difficulties in your relationships to talking through problems at work. And you've got a group of men who are kind of all in this together and, and you see each other. It's kind of like a safe space. I personally haven't been in a men's support group. Have you Scott? No, but I can tell you that Guys say I love you now a lot more to other guys. I love yeah. you. I mean, I, I, do. I, I, you're right. I've seen that. Like, I love you, man. <laughs> I love you. It well, still feels awkward movie. to me. Sorry. It's, it's really awkward, but it's at least kind of seeping into the dialogue. I mean, it's only awkward when the people saying it are awkward. Yeah. Like there, there's members of both sexes that do it awkwardly, but I, I feel it's way more commonplace amongst young middle-aged and older men it's a lot more acceptable obviously like with people with antiquated beliefs it's not going to be the same but yeah it's it's um i do i do see guys saying i love you to each other more and but even for me it, it still feels a little awkward but i i've been trying to embrace it i we i have a um you know where's where's so in quarantine um the mayor of la has encouraged us to create teams quarantines it was just like a group of maybe a couple friends that you can hang, start to hang out together as long as you're not hanging out with that. other people. Yeah. So it's like, okay. Without calling it that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I have, I have a couple of friends that we created a little team that now we can hang out and we don't hang out with other people. So we're not really exposing each other potentially to the coronavirus. And I had a moment recently, it was, uh, it was a week or so ago and um, some friends of mine were doing mushrooms and uh, we had a, a moment where my one friend, we had a heart to heart, and he he shared something very personal with me and and he was he was crying and we were hugging each other and we were like having this moment and he he was saying he told me he loved me you know it was platonic it was um but he was just like you know i love you right and i i kind of paused and felt a little awkward about it and i i said he's like you don't know and i said well no 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 i know i know you care about me i know but i guess i don't know to the extent we don't really talk about it. and he's like no 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 like i i love you i i want you to know that and and i couldn't say it back to him in the moment i I just felt, I, I, fe I do love him as well, but in, in the moment I just, I was taken aback by and I hugged him and I kind of took it in. And then after a few minutes later, he said it again. And I said, I was able to say it back and I felt comfortable, but, but it was interesting because I kind of had the self-awareness moment. I was watching myself kind of work through all of these dynamics that we still experience as men. And even for me as like a gay man, I, I, you could say I'm maybe emotionally more open than the average guy. Maybe I'm just, you know, talking, um, you know, I'm just making a generalization, but even for someone like myself that considers myself to be emotionally open, I still definitely deal with these sorts of like, yeah, ma what, what the masculinity and what it means and friendship and relationships. It's, it's still well, there. And women tell each other, they love each other all the time. <laughs> like yeah love you i love you too. even even to women that you're not super close with like is it's easy to just kind of say it it's pretty soon like when we uh i'm trying to think maybe not as much um i always think about this because i say i love you to so many of my female friends but then it's like to my male friends who are you know love just as much i don't say it <laughs> as much because then it's like then what does that mean when i'm in a relationship like what <laughs> I was like, can we make more words for love? Can we have you like say I'm in love with you in your relationship? <laughs> yeah. Oh, in your relationship. Yeah. I wish there was another word, you know? I um, love you. I, lo I love you. <laughs> that, that's how Celine that's Celine Dion. That's how she says it. The power of love. I love <laughs> Power of love. Yeah, love. <laughs> love. <laughs> Every <laughs> night in awesome. my dreams. <laughs> I love Celine. I have a Celine Dion t-shirt. I always sing Celine Dion in karaoke. Do you? I What's your go-to? Or both sexes. Um, oh, you would kill Celine. I, I want to hear this. Oh, you would kill it. There were nights when the wind was so cold. Whoa. 
That my body falls in bed if I just listen to it right outside the window. And automatically it's like yes. half three karaoke songs because it's like seven and a half minutes long. Yeah, it is. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm that asshole who like picks the longest karaoke song ever. <laughs> <laughs> But you're supposed to like not be as good as the, like the song. Like it's it's always better in karaoke if you're not killing it. Like people like to see you fail. <laughs> they support you. <laughs> so I always yeah. try to be, like the best singers ever. Who I'm like I still I'm still working to that level. <laughs> well, in LA, a lot of people treat it like an audition, and it's hilarious. Yeah, <laughs> very it, serious. My stepmother is Chinese, and my stepbrother is Chinese, and they treat it like a competition. Holy cow! I did I did karaoke with my brother, my stepbrother. Well, my brother, and um, and he was aggressive. <laughs> he was just like, "Oh yeah," <laughs> very serious. Oh yeah, yeah. We were like, and then and then it's like, "Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah." Well, I got this. I got this. <laughs> it was fun. <laughs> yeah, I, I dated a um, couple Filipinos in my past, and I noticed that family. The Filipino family they they would have their own karaoke room. Oh yeah, very serious that. about it. They're very yeah. serious about their karaoke. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> it's great. Oh, I, I, we're actually, I hate to say this, but we have to come to an end. I've been having such a great time with this episode and we're talking to you, Kaiza, bringing you on the show. Thank you for, for joining us and talking oh, to us about you. this yeah, interesting I topic. Like, I feel like we could talk for, for hours. It goes by fast, right? Oh, well, maybe when I'm out in LA, we can do something else. Okay. Yeah. I would love that. <laughs> For everyone who's listening, I would love you to check out Kaiza. She has a an album coming out called Crave on August 14th. You can pre-save that on, on streaming platforms. And the song that we featured today is called When Boys Cry. When Boys Cry, check that out as well. Thank you for sharing it. And I love that we're, you know, we've been able to take one song and have this whole conversation about it. Uh, me too. That's that. That's the concept behind the show, and it, it's really working. I mean, we're we're in our sixth episode now, and each one just keeps getting more more interesting. And I I love that we can have these t- conversations around the music. Have we arrived at a conclusion from our from our talk? <laughs> I have it. What yeah. is it? But when you kiss me like this, <laughs> that's, that's my conclusion. Fun. The, the conclusion is the power of love. Well, I would no, say no, no, no. the conclusion is that, that there were moments of gold and there were flashes of light. There were there were things I'd never do again, but then it all seemed to be right. Yes. <laughs> there were nights of endless pleasure. Uh-huh. <laughs> I just want you to know Meatloaf did this song really well too. Just saying. Did he? Oh wait, yeah. I think I've seen he wrote it. It's yeah. I I forget about that. Wait, I did not know that. How did I not know that? That it was a meatloaf song? Yeah. How did oh, I just know? Did he write it? Yeah. Yeah. I thought it was David Foster who wrote it. That makes sense. <laughs> well, he, let me look it up. Our What's the name of the song? It's all coming back to me now. All coming back to me now. It's like. No, we're both wrong. It was, uh, it was meatloaf's uh, contemporary Jim Steinman who wrote it. Oh, okay. But, but uh, David yeah. Foster produced uh, Celine Dion's rendition. Okay. David Foster? Well, they- that makes sense. So we're both wrong. But you know what? It's a great way to end the show. Actually, <laughs> it's okay to admit when you're wrong. So Ryan, yeah. I made a mistake and I'm sorry. I'm sorry too, Scott. And I love you. I love well, you I, too. I think that's actually a really good way to wrap up. It's a, is that it, like, I think everyone's afraid of making mistakes. I think that actually is a universal thing. Um, Accountability, bro. Yeah, vulnerability. And it's it's really hard to show our mistakes. Accountability but too. The mistakes are what gives us feedback to move in the right direction. They, they give us the feedback to grow and to overcome and to change and to dissolve, to dissolve the things in our life that are obstacles. And so if you don't just face your mistakes head on and just accept them and, and see them for what they are, you're not going to be able to move forward. And, and I think maybe that's a really good way to conclude that. Um, I think for men, maybe speaking. I'm retiring. I'm retiring, Kaiza. You're, this is your show now. That was such a beautiful way to wrap it up. <laughs> I'm, I'm handing the reins over to you. <laughs> that was awesome. I'll be your co-host. <laughs> yeah. What do you, what do you mean? Oh, I, I have a list of podcast ideas. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Let's talk about it when you come, when you, when you're back in LA. Yeah. Okay. Great. Okay. Such a pleasure having you on the show. You too. Bye hey, guys. Thank you. Bye Scott. Bye Kaiza. Bye. Take care everyone. Take care. Bye. Bye.